Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and welcome back. Part two of our next Vice Presidential Series installment as we're taking a look at the 24th Vice President of the United States, Garrett Augustus Hobart. Uh, yeah, I am flying solo, of course, for the audio portion. Henry's not with me. Um, and yeah, yesterday was part one, of course. Part one, we really exclusively only looked at the childhood, birthplace, you know, younger life of Garrett Hobart right here in uh, New Jersey, of course. And now part two, we're going to dive into his uh, vice presidency, his legacy, his untimely death, and then, of course, his funeral and burial and gravesite and all that stuff. So that'll be today in part two. Um, I think I'll be able to get everything I want to get in in this part two, including the bonus footage. However, we'll see. We might need a uh, short part three. We shall see. But let's dive right into it. Next Vice Presidential Series installment, part two, Garrett Augustus Hobart, our 24th Vice President of the United States. Here we go. A homesick candidate. Since the Civil War, New Jersey had leaned toward Democratic presidential candidates. President Grover Cleveland had carried the state in 1892, but during the economic depression that followed, both houses of the legislature and the governorship of New Jersey went Republican, suggesting that the state could be taken by the national ticket in 1896. Looking over the scene, the Democratic New York graphic noted that there was no other Republican in New Jersey as strong as this sturdy, bright-faced, genial gentleman. In 1896, the New Jersey delegation went to the Republican convention in St. Louis determined to nominate Hobart for vice president. As a way of consolidating the party's recent gains within their state. When Ohio Governor McKinley defeated House Speaker Thomas Reed and several other prominent candidates for the presidential nomination, newspapers identified some 20 potential candidates for the vice presidency. All of them were governors, cabinet members, senators, and representatives, with the exception of Garrett Hobart, who remained unknown outside of his state. Yet, when the vote was taken, Hobart, who had attended the convention as a delegate, emerged the nominee. Hobart insisted that he had not sought the nomination, but that it was handed to him as a tribute from my friends. It came equally as a tribute from Marcus A. Hanna, the Cleveland industrialist and political strategist who masterminded McKinley's nomination. Hanna wanted a ticket to satisfy the business interests of America, and Hobart, a corporate lawyer, fit that requirement perfectly. Hannah's biographer noted that even if Hobart did little to strengthen the ticket, he did nothing to weaken it. Hobart himself felt ambivalent about the honor. Ambitious for national office, he was realistic enough to know what it would ultimately cost him. From the convention, he wrote to his wife, I have been too busy to be homesick, but to tell the honest truth, I am heartsick over my own prospects. It looks to me I will be nominated for vice president, whether I want it or not, and as I get nearer to the point where I may, I am dismayed at the thought. If I want a nomination, everything is going my way. But when I realize all that it means in work, worry, and loss of home and bliss, I am overcome, so overcome, 
I am simply miserable. Unlike the Democratic presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan, who barnstormed the country making speeches, William McKinley stayed at home in Canton, Ohio, running his campaign from his front porch. Hobart similarly limited his speaking to his portico in New Jersey. McKinley and Hobart stood firm for the gold standard and the protective tariff. Brian, for his part, ran on a free silver platform and attracted many desperate farmers and debtors to his crusade. But economic conditions and corporate interests favored the Republicans. McKinley won by a half million votes, or 51% of the total cast. His Republican ticket carried 23 of the 45 states, including Garrett Hobart's New Jersey. The Little Cream White House. For a running mate, McKinley had preferred Speaker Thomas B. Reed, with whom he had worked for many years in the House. But Reed would accept only the top spot on the ticket. Although McKinley and Hobart were strangers by comparison, the president had no difficulty warming up to Gus Hobart. The wealthy Hobarts leased a house at 21 Lafayette Square, which became known as the Little Cream White House. Built in 1828 by Colonel Ogle Taylor, the house had hosted Washington's high society during the antebellum years. At the outset of the Civil War, General George McClellan had taken it as his headquarters. And after the war, Pennsylvania Senator Don Cameron had remodeled and restored the old house. The Hobarts used it to entertain lavishly, particularly because President McKinley's wife was an invalid who could not shoulder the traditional social burdens of the White House. The president frequently attended Hobart's dinners and afternoon smokers, where he could meet informally with party leaders from Capitol Hill. No previous vice president had visited the White House as often as Gus Hobart, due in part to the warm friendship, friendship that developed between Ida McKinley and Jenny Hobart. Mrs. McKinley suffered from epilepsy, which left her a recluse in the White House. President McKinley doted on his wife and grew to depend on Jenny Hobart, who visited Ida daily. The president constantly turned to me to help her wherever I could, Mrs. Hobart wrote in her memoirs. Not because I was second lady, but because I was their good friend. Whenever McKinley had to be away from his wife in the evenings, he would entrust her to Jenny Hobart's care. He also invited Mrs. Hobart to the White House social functions because her presence gave him confidence. In addition to seeing each other in Washington, the McKinleys and Hobarts vacationed together at Bluff Point on Lake Champlain. McKinley looked on Hobart as a trusted advisor. Although the vice president was not invited to join meetings of the cabinet, the president and cabinet members consulted with him freely. The mutual regard between the two men made them, in the words of one acquaintance, co-adjusters in the fixing of the policies of the administration to an extent never before known. Arthur Wallace Dunn, a newspaper correspondent who covered presidents from Benjamin Harrison to Warren Harding, marveled that for the first time in my recollection, and the last time for that matter, the vice president was recognized as somebody, as a part of the administration, and as a part of the body over which he presided. Dunn described Hobart as a business politician whose knowledge of the relations between business and politics 
made his judgments extremely useful. McKinley even turned to his vice president for personal financial advice. Having once suffered the embarrassment of declaring personal bankruptcy, McKinley turned over a portion of his monthly presidential salary, which Vice President Hobart invested for him. The Splendid Little War Although Hobart socialized more frequently and worked more closely with the president than had most of his predecessors, his primary function remained that of presiding over the Senate. In his brief, self-deprecatory inaugural address, Hobart had told the senators that, while he was unfamiliar with their rules and procedures, he would work to the best of his abilities, feeling confident that they would indulge him as considerately as they had all of the previous occupants of the chair. Hobart's experiences presiding over the New Jersey Assembly and State Senate served him well, and he soon won favorable notices for impartial and informed rulings. Massachusetts Senator Henry Cabot Lodge applauded Hobart for abandoning his predecessor's habit of submitting nearly every question of order to the Senate and instead ruling promptly on these points himself, as every presiding officer ought to do. One newspaper correspondent wrote that initially, Hobart's business-like advice and warning intimations rather nettled many of the senators, but that over time he appeared to captivate the Senate with his genial good nature. Hobart settled comfortably into the job. Senate vouchers show that he purchased for the vice president's room in the Capitol silk mohair carpeting, Neapolitan silk curtains, Persian throw rugs, and a silk velour slumber robe made to match the velour cushions on his sofa. <laughs> Pretty interesting. Kind of, uh, you know, quote unquote, pimp the place out, it sounds like. Hobart also ordered the grandfather clock and the imposing mahogany desk that his successors continue to use. Presiding over the Senate was no easy task, however. In 1898, following the unexplained sinking of the U.S. battleship Maine in Havana Harbor, Sentiment in the Senate swung sharply toward war with Spain, which at that time still ruled, ruled Cuba as a colony. President McKinley's cautious attempts to avoid going to war made him seem indecisive. When McKinley's friend, Senator William Mason of Illinois, announced in favor of war, a demonstration broke out on the Senate floor that Hobart found impossible to quiet. As Mrs. Hobart recalled, the vice president was worried to desperation over the rising rebelliousness of the Senate and took his concerns to McKinley. Mr. President, I can no longer hold back the Senate, he warned. They will act without you if you do not act at once. Accepting the inevitable, McKinley called on Congress to declare that a state of war existed with Spain. Hobart sent the president a pen to sign the declaration. The splendid little war with Spain was fought and won within a six-month period. At the, at the conclusion of the 55th Congress, Vice President Hobart congratulated the Senate on this remarkable achievement, noting that, unlike any other session in the history of our country, this Congress has witnessed the inception, prosecution, and conclusion of a war. More than just a war Congress, it had also been a peace Congress, having approved the ratification of the Treaty of Paris that ended the Spanish-American War. The vice president played a significant part in one aspect of that peace treaty. 
Although the United States had pledged not to take Cuba as its own territory, it did decide to hold the Philippine Islands unexpectedly acquired from Spain. After the Senate had approved the peace treaty by the necessary two-thirds vote, Georgia Democrat Augustus O. Bacon had sponsored an amendment promising independence to the Philippines if it established a stable government. Due to the absence of several administration supporters, the vote was tied at 29 to 29. Garrett Hobart assured the taking of the territory for the United States by casting the deciding vote against Bacon's amendment. The Vice President's Valedictory The Vice President's speech concluding the second session of the 55th Congress was in fact his valedictory, for he would die before the next Congress convened. In addressing the senators for the last time, he noted that the Senate of the United States is a peculiar body, made up, as you know, of many elements, and in it, its membership, you will find not only straight and stalwart Republicans to whose active efforts the country is now looking for relief, but by medalists, populists, silverites, both Republican and Democratic, and a few gold Democrats. Despite the senator's many differences, Hobart, as presiding officer, observed that each of them stood on the common ground of patriotism, pride in the nation's history, zealousness for its constitution, and devotion to its flag. For a generation old enough to remember the Civil War, the Spanish-American War appeared to represent the end of the old divisions that had led to secession. Former Union and Confederate soldiers supported a common war effort, with some from both sides donning uniforms once again. Beginning in early 1899, Hobart suffered from fainting spells, triggered by serious heart problems. He never fully recovered. Yet that summer, he performed a last major service for the McKinley administration when he helped the gentle president to fire his Secretary of War, General Russell A. Alger. A large, affable man with presidential ambitions, Alger had become tarred by scandals that emerged during the Spanish-American War, particularly charges that unscrupulous war suppliers had fed embalmed beef to American soldiers. McKinley saw the need to sacrifice his Secretary of War to the demands of public opinion, but could not bring himself to fire a friend. When Secretary of State John Hay declined to deliver the bad news, the task fell to Hobart. That summer, Algor and his wife regularly spent weekends with the Hobarts at their summer house at Norwood Park, New Jersey. One evening, Hobart took Alger into the smoking room and suggested that he find some excuse for retiring from the cabinet. During the next week, newspapers published stories that Alger had been pressured to step down, but that the president was standing loyally by him. The oblivious Alger returned to Hobart's seaside home the next weekend and insisted that in light of the president's loyal backing, he had no reason to leave the cabinet. Now Hobart bluntly explained that the president would feel very much relieved if the secretary would resign. Alger could not believe what he was hearing until Hobart admitted that he was speaking with the president's authorization. The shaken Secretary of War hurried back to Washington, and at 9 o'clock on Monday morning, he handed his resignation to President McKinley. As Hobart suffered increasingly debilitating attacks and his strength declined, 
rumors spread that his illness would keep him from running again for vice president. In the fall of 1899, as McKinley was preparing a grand reception to honor the return of Admiral George Dewey from the Philippines, he invited the Hobarts to stay at the White House. I can imagine no place where you will be more comfortable than here. But Hobart declined. He conceded that he must remain in Patterson and could not return to Washington either for the Dewey reception or to preside again over the Senate when it reconvened that December. This public announcement was an admission that the vice president was in virtual retirement with no hope of recovery. Garrett Hobart died on November 21st of 1899. Arriving at the Hobart home in Patterson for the funeral, President McKinley told the family, no one outside of this home feels this loss more deeply than I do. History has remembered Garrett Hobart less for his life than for his death. The void he left was quickly filled. The powerful Senator Mark Hanna moved into the Little Cream White House and the vacant vice presidency was soon occupied by one of America's most dynamic political leaders, Theodore Roosevelt. McKinley's second running mate in 1900 bore little resemblance to the man he succeeded. In short order, the young, energetic Roosevelt and the progressive reform movement he embodied eclipsed not only Hobart, but McKinley as well, as the United States entered the 20th century. There you have it, folks. Garrett Hobart, New Jersey native, uh, died in office. The sixth, at the time, the sixth vice president to die in office. Um, and the amazing thing is, that was in uh, November of 1899, in, in the fall of 1899. If he would have just survived another little over a year, uh, and if he would have been the running mate of McKinley for the second term, which in all likelihood he definitely would have been, Garrett Hobart would have became president of the United States when William McKinley was assassinated. So that's how close this New Jersey native came to becoming the president of the United States. Pretty incredible. So there you have it, guys. Um, and oh my God, look who I found. Well, hello, Henry. Hello. How you doing, bud? I'm good. Yeah, everything going good? Mm -hmm. We're talking about our 24th vice president. Do you know who that is or no? Garrett Hobart. Very good, Garrett Hobart. You've been listening. Great job. And do you know where Garrett Hobart was from? No. Well, where are we? New Jersey. New Jersey, that's right. He's a New Jersey guy. He was born, you know how Daddy grew up in Eatontown, New Jersey? Mm -hmm. Well, he was born and grew up in a little bit in Long Branch, New Jersey, which is right next to Eatontown. And then he lived in Marlboro, New Jersey. And yeah, he was a New Jersey guy through and through. Pretty cool, right? Yes. Very cool. Well, I'm glad we found you, Henry. <laughs> Mm. Everything going good? You enjoying our vice presidential series? Yes. Very cool. All right. Well, there you go, guys. That's Garrett Hobart in a nutshell. Little uh, little hello drop in from Henry. And uh, here we go. Some more fun facts and some things I want to touch on regarding Garrett Hobart. Here we go. So as I always like to do, I always like to take a little bit of a you know a dive into. You know, look into the election that got the vice president that we're speaking of elected, of course. Uh, this would be the 1896 United States presidential election. Of course, William McKinley, the Republican, his running mate, Garrett Hobart. They went up against the Democrat, William Jennings Bryant, uh, and his running mate, Arthur Sewell, the Democratic Silver, and Thomas E. Watson, the populist. He had two different running mates. Um, the electoral vote count, McKinley won 271 to 176. Uh, McKinley carried 23 states to Bryan's 22. P 
popular vote, 7.1 million to 6.5 million. 51% of the popular vote went to McKinley. I mean, they won pretty handedly. I mean, it wasn't like a blowout, like a mopping of the floor, so to speak. But, um, you know, McKinley and Hobart did win fairly handedly. Uh, now, what I will say is, and you're seeing maps and all that stuff of like the election results and some, uh, you know, uh, poster campaign posters. Uh, what I want to do is I want to read just a few excerpts from different sources that I've been using for Hobart, of course. Uh, so this is these things I'm going to read are, you know, generally just surrounding his nomination for vice president and then the election and becoming vice president vice president so um here we go uh hobart also sensed a republican victory in 1896 his duties as a republican national committee member and as a delegate at large from new jersey occupied his time in the immediate weeks prior to the party's state and national conventions endorsed by the new jersey convention as a vice presidential favored son hobart left patterson new jersey on june 8th to entertain the New Jersey delegation at the Lawyers Club in New York City and make arrangements for the National Convention. He also conferred with Senator Matthew S. Quay of Pennsylvania, who endorsed Hobart for the vice presidency. On his way to the National Convention in St. Louis, Hobart stopped at McKinley's home in Canton, Ohio, to discuss politics with the former congressman and governor who was the frontrunner for the presidential nomination. Meanwhile, the stage was being set for his vice presidential nomination. Confident of Hobart's nomination, Senator John M. Thurston of Nebraska, a Republican National Co Convention chairman, arrived in St. Louis wearing a McKinley-Hobart button. Senator Redfield Proctor of Vermont also sported a similar ornament. Similar, similar ornament. Illinois lawyer, banker, and businessman Charles G. Dawes, who later served as vice president, lined up the Illinois delegation for Hobart. <clears throat> at first dismayed and overwhelmed at the thought of his possible nomination, Hobart expressed his innermost feelings and trepidations in letters and conversations with his wife and close friends. His concern centered mainly on the work, the worry, and the loss of home life connected with political office. He was also cognizant of the impenetrable vacuum that characterized the vice president, a person usually viewed as the trailer to the ticket, a fifth wheel in the national bandwagon who rolled painlessly into oblivion. Knowing that McKinley needed a running mate from an eastern seaboard state, Hobart hoped that Thomas B. Reed, Speaker of the House of Representatives, would consent to accept second place, but Reed adamantly refused to consider this possibility. Although he approached the convention with misgivings, Hobart ultimately decided that he would neither seek nor avoid the vice presidential nomination. He would allow events to take their own natural course. Republican delegates convened in St. Louis on June 16th of 1896 for their quadrennial, quadrennial national convention. McKinley easily triumphed on the first ballot to become the party's presidential standard bearer. The platform, which called for a protective tariff and sound money, contained ideas and words offered by Hobart. In fact, his unwavering endorsement of the gold standard helped to influence the party's position on that issue. When delegates began to consider vice presidential possibilities, Thomas C. Platt, the recognized leader in New York Republican politics, attempted to force upon the convention the name of Governor Levi P. Morton of New York, who had served as vice president from 1889 to 1893 during the administration of Benjamin Harrison. Because there was no one candidate from New York upon whom the Republicans could agree, the delegates needed to look elsewhere. Mark Hanna, a wealthy Ohio industrialist who shrewdly managed McKinley's campaign, preferred Hobart, and he used his powerful influence 
to further the ambitions of the New Jersey contender. United States Senator William J. Sewell, the boss of New Jersey Republicanism, also favored Hobart for the vice presidency, contending his presence on the ticket would guarantee Republican success in the Garden State. The New Jersey delegation thereupon presented Hobart as the state's candidate for the vice presidency. Hobart was nominated by Judge John Franklin Fort, later to serve as governor of New Jersey, who emphasized that his politically regenerated state merited the recognition. J. Otis Humphrey, an Illinois attorney who later served as a federal district judge, seconded Hobart's nomination. Hobart scored an easy victory on the first ballot over his nearest competitor, Henry Clay Evans of Tennessee. McKinley and Hannah joined forces with Hobart in 1896 for a variety of reasons. First, Hobart was politically acceptable to and ideologically compatible with McKinley. Hobart and McKinley belonged to the same wing of their party. Neither political doctrine nor a separate allegiance divided the two men. Second, Hobart entertained no presidential ambitions and carried no burdens, burdensome, burdensome baggage. Although he had not been governor or senator and was without a national reputation, Hobart was a moderate and non-controversial politician who possessed personal integrity and wealth, although he lacked political enemies. In short, he did little to strengthen the ticket, but he did nothing to weaken it either. The third, Hobart lived in a region that provided geographical balance to the ticket in an era when both parties, by prevailing practice, selected their presidential and vice presidential nominees from the Midwest and East. As a native of New Jersey, Hobart was expected to help carry the, that pivotal state for the Republican slate and add vigor to the ticket to the East, in the East. For these reasons, Garrett Hobart, a conservative pragmatist, emerged as a national political leader in the Republican coalition of 1896. After receiving the vice presidential nomination, Hobart thanked his New Jersey colleagues and the Republican delegates for their expression of confidence in his ability to discharge the duties of the vice presidency. He pledged to employ his best efforts to further McKinley's election. Hobart thereupon returned to New Jersey, where on July 17th, the committee appointed by the convention to notify Hobart of his nomination arrived at his Patterson home. Charles W. Fairbanks of Indiana, chairman of this committee, who would later serve as senator and vice president, remarked that the vice presidency had been graced by eminent statesmen who had contributed to the upbuilding of the strength and glory of the nation. In his reply, Hobart accepted the nomination. He promised to help the party achieve electoral success and reaffirmed his support for the gold standard and protective tariffs as sound principles on which to restore the nation's prosperity. The nominee pointed out that monetary uncertainty or instability could lead to serious consequences and that the gravity of the financial question could not be overestimated because gold was the one standard of value among all enlightened commercial nations. Hobart declared that the issue could not be compromised. The presidential election of 1896 was a crucial context in U.S. history constituting a fundamental turning point in American electoral politics and demonstrating the period of political realignment. Hobart assumed an active role in the 1896 presidential campaign. He delivered speeches, corresponded with McKinley, visited the most important cities of New Jersey, helped to manage the campaign from an office in New York City, and received delegations of visitors on the front lawn of his home in New Jersey. Like McKinley, who conducted a front porch campaign from his home in Canton, Hobart abstained from the national barnstorming method identified with the Democratic and populist presidential nominee, William Jennings Bryan, 
who ran on a free coinage platform. Twice during the campaign, Hobart, Hobart journeyed to McKinley's home to confer with the head of the ticket. On the second visit, he brought his letter of acceptance with him. Hobart met McKinley and Herman H. Colsat, editor and publisher of the Chicago Times-Herald. The New Jersey Republican read his letter of acceptance while McKinley, who had super supervised its preparation, smoked a cigar and offered suggestions. McKinley was exceedingly cautious about the exact wording, but Hobart gladly accepted the revisions. You know, and talk of a national office really began for Hobart in 1895, emanating from party leaders and apparently Hobart himself. Jenny Hobart, his wife, remembered a spring 1895 lunch conversation between Garrett Hobart and Mark Hanna about McKinley's presidential chances in New York City and thought this signaled something larger for her husband. Um, it also, you know, kind of goes on to say, you know, how he was involved, of course, about um, Governor Griggs of uh, New Jersey. He was uh, definitely involved in his campaign and getting him elected in New Jersey uh, as governor. Um, and then it kind of further talks about, like, despite the accolades, his private attitude, meaning Hobart's, toward the nomination was mixed. Some of his hesitancy was personal. His daughter Fanny died while the family was traveling together through Italy in June of 1895, but her body was only interred at Patterson in March of 1896, and the Hobarts were devastated. He expressed real reluctance to leave behind his business interests and Patterson lifestyle for Washington, D.C. William E. Sackett, who knew him well, recalled that in national politics, Hobart was distrustful of himself. He was a singularly modest man and one of the plainest and least pretentious as well. He seemed never to know what power there was in him until a call to a new field of endeavor gave occasion for its exercise. His rise from station to station had come to him not all as the result of his own intrusion, but wholly because those around him saw the worth there was in him. It was all the unconscious tribute of his compeers to the latent power of the man. So in politics, the forces around him pushed him to the front. He never helped nor ever resisted. Just went along with the tide, as it were, and found himself at the head of the swim and leading when he supposed, supposed he only had been keeping along with the current. While attending the 1896 Republican Convention in St. Louis, with the press reporting his candidacy and squeezing him for information, Hobart confided, confided to his wife. I read that earlier about being heartsick over his own prospects. Um, <clears throat> now let me see here, a little further ahead. So after he was nominated uh, for the vice presidency... A tremendous celebration organized at the Patterson, New Jersey Armory welcomed Hobart home. The city ran cut of fireworks and ordered more from New York City. And 15,000 people attended. Hobart sheepishly told the onlookers he was embarrassed but honored by their tribute. His embarrassment disappeared by early July as he strongly endorsed the gold standard and condemned the Bryanite Silver Movement in his notification address. An honest dollar worth 100 cents everywhere cannot be coined out of 53 cents worth of silver plus a legislative fiat. Such a debasement of our currency would inevitably produce incalculable, incalculable loss, appalling disaster, and national dishonor. Though a protectionist, Hobart believed the money issue, not tariffs, led to a November Republican victory, and in denouncing silver, his rhetoric far outstripped William McKinley. Hobart's insistence made money the 1896 Republican issue. 
At one point, he called any greenbacker or populist who denounced gold a commercial idiot, which delighted Eastern financiers. Financiers. After a July vacation in Plattsburgh, New York, also a soon-to-be favorite spot of the McKinleys, Hobart plunged into the campaign with enthusiasm and grit. In October of 1896, he reluctantly began a whirlwind New Jersey speaking tour to drum up Republican voters, visiting Camden, Jersey City, Long Branch, Newark, and Patterson. And when he finished, he remarked to his wife, Thank heaven that is all done with. I did pretty well after all, didn't I? Hobart worked at his office on election day to distract himself, but he returned home that afternoon. Three telegraph wires attached to his Patterson home, and at 8.30 p.m. news came that McKinley won a tremendous victory over William Jennings Bryan. Days later, Mr. Garrett A. Hobart, class of 1863, visited Rutgers College as guest of honor at their 130th anniversary celebrations. Their most famous alum was now Vice President-elect of the United States. Garrett Hobart spent the winter before the inauguration concluding business affairs, reading about the Vice Presidency, and readying for the move south. He resigned from leadership in companies that might have federal government business like Vice Presidency of the East Jersey Water Company. But he refused to step down from every corporate board or totally divest himself. It would be highly ridiculous for me to resign from the different companies in which I am officer and a stockholder whose interests are not in the least affected or likely to be by my position as Vice President. If that changed... More resignations would follow, resignations would follow. But for now, I have no intention of resigning all the offices that I hold. Another uh, kind of quote. On the other hand, the adjoining state of New Jersey submitted an eligible candidate, Mr. Garrett A. Hobart, who had done much to strengthen the Republican Party in his own neighborhood. Mr. Hobart was well known to Mr. Hanna, Mark Hanna, and in all probability, his nomination had been scheduled for some time. It was practically announced early in June. He was a lawyer and a businessman with an exclusively local reputation. And if he did little to strengthen the ticket, he did nothing to weaken it. We know that quote. Uh, this is actually from John Franklin Ford of New Jersey on June 18th of 1896. This quote, not for himself, but for our state. Not for his ambition, but to give the nation the highest type of public official do we come to this convention. By the command of our state and in the name of the Republican Party of New Jersey, unconquered and in un in unconquerable, undivided and indivisible, with our united voices speaking for all that counts for good citizenship in our state and nominate to you for the office of Vice President of the Republic, Garrett A. Hobart of New Jersey. This is a little bit about, uh, like a sentence or two about the campaign. McKinley was not as strong a supporter of the gold standard as Hobart, and considered modifying some of Hobart's expressed views on the gold standard before the acceptance was printed for public distribution. Hobart insisted on it being printed without change, writing, I think I know the sentiment of Eastern men better than you can, and with this knowledge and my convictions, I must retain the statements as I have written them. On March 2nd of 1897, Hobart and his family left Patterson, New Jersey to travel to Washington by special train. On March 4th, he was inaugurated as vice president in the Senate chamber. The Chicago Daily News predicted Garrett A. Hobart will not be seen or heard until after four years he emerges from the impenetrable vacuum of the vice presidency. And here I'm going to show you 
a little video clip of the inauguration of 1897. So here, take a look at this little video clip. March 4th, 1897, I just said, as you, and you just saw in this little video clip, Stevenson administered the oath of office to Hobart as the nation's 24th vice president. The ceremony occurred in the Senate chamber with members of Congress, President Grover Cleveland, President-elect McKinley, governors, cabinet officers, and other dignitaries present for the occasion. After taking the oath, Hobart delivered a brief inaugural address in which he promised to abide by a conservative, conservative, equitable, and conscientious construction and enforcement of the upper chamber's rules, while at the same time conserving the precedents and established traditions that had contributed to making that tribunal the most distinguished of the world's legislative bodies. Uh, he pledged to assist the senators to move expeditiously in the interests of good government and positive legislation, maintaining that any attempt to obstruct the regular course of wise and prudent legislative action after the fullest and freest discussion was neither consistent with true senatorial courtesy nor conducive to the welfare of the people. Hoping to form genuine friendships with members of the Senate, the Vice President announced his attention intention to discharge his duties in such a manner as to lighten their labor and promote the pleasant and efficient transaction of the public business in such a way that their work would redound to the peace and honor of the country and the prosperity and happiness of all the people. Upon the conclusion of Hobart's speech, Cleveland leaned over to McKinley and whispered that it was the sweetest oration he had heard in a long time. Skillfully presiding over the Senate, using a gavel made from his father's apple tree, Hobart took his duty seriously and prepared assiduously for the legislative agenda. Regularly attending Senate sessions, the Vice President became known as a chronic audience. He enjoyed sitting in the presiding officer's chair, listening to the debates strolling the corridors, visiting committee sessions, lunching with senators, attending afternoon smokers, holding dinner parties, and smoothing things over for McKinley in the upper house. A kindly gentleman with modest dignity and a good conversationalist who was known for his charm and his willingness to compromise. He gave new meaning to the vice presidential office, gained the respect of the Senate, and the president influenced the Senate to promote the administration's policies and sought harmonious feelings between the executive and legislative branches. McKinley had an invaluable ally in Hobart. The Hobarts leased the Cameron Mansion at 21 Lafayette Square, which stood diagonally across from the White House, often called the Cream White House, the home was owned by Senator James D. Cameron of Pennsylvania, who had first wanted a $10,000 rental agreement, which Hobart, whose salary was only $8,000, refused outright. Fortunately, the two Republicans came to an agreement. The proximity of the Cameron House to the White House facilitated frequent social meetings between the McKinleys and the Hobarts. Jenny T. Hobart often served as the White House hostess for Ida C. McKin S. McKinley, an inv invalid who experienced seizures of unconsciousness. Unable to fulfill all her social duties, Mrs. McKinley often turned to Mrs. Hobart for assistance. The Vice President's charming wife, who popularized the title Second Lady, thoroughly enjoyed her role as a Washington hostess with a busy social calendar. Hobart loyally supported McKinley's programs. In 1897, he endorsed the Dingley Tariff, a high protectionist measure. Later that year, upon the resignation of Attorney General Joseph McKenna, Hobart persuaded McKinley 
to appoint Governor Griggs of New Jersey to the vacant cabinet spot. Although McKinley did nearly everything possible to promote Hobart as a vital part of the administration, such as soliciting his views on issues and consulting with him on affairs of state, he neglected to invite the vice president to attend cabinet meetings, a surprising oversight. Socially, Hobart was the first vice president to assert predominance over Sir Julian Ponsefort, or Ponseforte, Dean of the Diplomatic Corps in Washington, who previously had claimed a position next to the president in receiving lines. Recognizing Hobart as the second highest official, McKinley asserting unmistakably, unmistakably that second place at diplomatic receptions belonged to the vice president, ordered Hobart to stand next to him instead of the British ambassador. You know, and then uh, a lot of things that I'm kind of reading, it's, it's, you know, just about different things in the Senate. We did touch on the Spanish-American War. Uh, you know, of course, the only tie-breaking vote uh, that the single casting vote that uh, Hobart ever had, um, you know, ratified the treaty uh, of after the Senate had ratified the Treaty of Paris. Um, we we explained that, of course, Hobart's vote there, tie-breaking vote. Uh, then on March 4th of 1899, before declaring the Senate adjourned, Hobart addressed the members, you know, recalling the Spanish-American War, you know, that sort of thing. And then, of course, you know, we also touched on the whole Secretary of War, Russell Alger, who uh, McKinley wanted to, you know, fire and, and get rid of. And that fell into the lap of Garrett Hobart to do so. Uh, and we spoke about that, how that all went down. Um, kind of reading some more here for you. Um, this is kind of at first. Upon moving to Washington... The Hobarts established themselves at the Arlington Hotel, which was the Washington home to many political men of the era, including Hannah. Soon, however, Pennsylvania Senator Don Cameron offered them the lease of the house he owned. Of course, that's the one that we talked about, the Little Cream White House. Um, you know, we talked about that, of course. You know, and then, as I said, he was kind of known as the assistant president. Um, Hobart was more assertive as Senate president than his predecessors had been. It was customary for the vice president not to rule on disputed points, but to submit them to a vote. Hobart, with his experience as a presiding officer in the New Jersey legislature, took a more assertive role, ruling on disputes and trying to expedite legislation. Hobart was initially diffident in his role feeling himself unproven beside longtime national legislators, but soon gained self-confidence, writing in a letter that, I find that I am as good and as capable as any of them. If they know a whole lot of things I don't know, I also know a whole lot of things they don't know. And there is a common humanity running through them, all that makes us all as one, after all. Hobart was so successful at guiding the administration's legislative agenda through the Senate that he became known as the assistant president. As I said, Hobart was a constant in, in his attendance at the Senate. One onlooker called him the chronic audience. Um, just, you know, he was always there. He was very involved as far as, like, you know, his role presiding over the Senate. And, you know, when uh, when Hobart had to remove and basically fire uh, Alger, uh, and after Alger returned to Washington, he confronted McKinley. Uh, he remonstrated against the president's failure to see him directly and deplored the roundabout method of forcing his resignation, which he submitted to the president, uh, effective August 1st of 1899. Alger did have a valid point on the issue McKinley showed weakness and decisiveness and absence of common sense, which were totally out of character with his administration. He should have handled the matter forthrightly from the beginning rather than delegating an unpleasant presidential duty to his terminally ill vice president. 
McKinley's action was inexcusable. Grateful in the end for Hobart's services, McKinley wired his thanks to the vice president, and the drama officially ended when Elio Root of New York entered the cabinet as Secretary of War. Uh, the, the battle in the Senate over the ratification of the controversial peace treaty with Spain and the Al Gore affair took, you know, definitely took their toll on the vice president. Long hours of hard work and a weak heart exhausted him, resulting in a physical collapse in the spring of 1899 from which he never recovered. He went to Long Branch, New Jersey to recuperate and stayed at Norwood Park, his seaside home on the coast. It was actually a rental home that, that he had. Failing to improve, he returned to his Patterson home where McKinley visited him. The two corresponded that autumn. Hobart wrote of his sleepless nights, nervous indigestion, the diagnoses, and the remedies the doctors had prescribed to give him relief. He grew weaker and weaker in October, knowing that he would not live much longer. By late 1898, Hobart had fallen ill with a serious heart ailment, which he had first concealed from the public. He continued Senate duty, but nearly collapsed after delivering an address closing the session. He accompanied the president on a vacation trip to Hannah's winter home in Thomasville, Georgia, but quickly contracted the flu and returned to Washington. By April of 1899, Hobart's illness was well known in the press, though Hannah assured the newspapers that Hobart would be on the ticket in 1900. Nothing but death or an earthquake can stop the renomination of Vice President Hobart. Hobart rented a home in his birthplace of Long Branch, then an upscale Jersey Shore resort. Doctors prescribed complete rest, and the Vice President amused himself by feeding two pet fish, a gold one named McKinley and a silver one named Brian. Despite his vice president's ill health, McKinley called upon him to break the news to Secretary of War Russell Alger that McKinley wanted him to resign. The secretary had ignored or misunderstood repeated hints from the president. Uh, so we know all that, of course, you know, what happened there. Um, Alger's resignation to Hobart's crystal insight and velvet tact, after which Hobart wrote to McKinley, my crystal insight is still clear, but the nap is slightly worn off my velvet tact. You know, that's regarding the whole Alger situation. After a vacation with the McKinleys on Lake Champlain, Hobart returned to Patterson, New Jersey on, in September. On November 1st of 1899, the government announced that Hobart would not return to public life. His condition deteriorated rapidly and he died on November 21st of 1899, at the age of 55. President McKinley told the family, no one outside of this home feels this loss more deeply than I do. New Jersey Governor Foster Voorhees ordered that state buildings be draped in mourning for 30 days and that flags be flown at half-staff until Hobart's funeral. Hobart's home, Carroll Hall, was open to the public for four hours so that citizens might pass by his open casket. 12,000 people did so. Hobart was laid to rest at Cedar Lawn Cemetery in Patterson after a large public funeral attended by President McKinley and many high government officials. Although the large government delegation meant that few local people could attend the service, a crowd of 50,000 came to Patterson to honor Hobart. The mausoleum over the grave was erected in 1901. His wife purchased 11 plots adjoining the family plot to accommodate the structure. The building has massive marble columns in the front with a heavy metal door on the back above the sarcophagus is a stained glass window. There are two sarcophagi in the center of the building for Garrett Hobart and his wife. Around the tomb are niches for other family members of the family. 
At the time of construction in 1901, the mausoleum cost about $80,000. Hobart died in Patterson on November 21st of 1899 from complications resulting from a heart attack. He was the sixth vice president to die in office. Uh, grieving McKinley attended the funeral. Following his death, John Hay became next in line of succession to the presidency, while Republican Senator William P. Fry of Maine, president pro tempore of the Senate, presided over that chamber. Senators eulogized Hobart in speeches from the floor. In 1903, the citizens of Patterson erected a bronze statue of the vice president next to that of Alexander Hamilton on the City Hall Plaza. On September 23rd of 1899, roughly two months, roughly before he died, he dictated his last letter to the president, President McKinley. And it said, I have been home nearly a week and have been in my room all of that time. I am just beginning to recover from the indisposition which made the last 10 days so disagreeable at Long Branch and which caused me sleepless nights. The doctors diagnosed this last trouble as nervous indigestion. Whether their diagnosis was correct or not, the remedy which they gave me induced copious vomiting, which has relieved me, and I now feel that I can lie down and sleep and rapidly regain the little I have lost. I have about decided not to go to New York during the Dewey reception because I fear the excitement might overtax me and again bring on this nervousness which has lately set me back. Hobart died of myocarditis in Patterson on November 21st of 1899. Sixth president, vice president, of course, as I said. In 1903, citizens, of course, they erected the... Uh, the statue as I just said although not an outstanding leader in the first rank of his generation Garrett Hobart was a competent and cautious politician both compassionate and firm like many 19th century vice presidents Hobart failed in his quest for lasting fame his short term as vice president was soon overshadowed by the assassination of William McKinley in 1901 in the dynamic presidency of Theodore Roosevelt. Yet during his period of three years in office, Hobart laid the foundation for 20th century vice presidents. In the public mind, Hobart was identified with the administration. A model presiding officer and advisor to the president, he made the vice presidential office what the framers of the Constitution intended it to be. Hobart lifted the office to the dignity and importance it deserved during the Gilded Age. By honoring the office, he honored himself. A successful businessman with a vision and one who epitomized the American dream of good fortune through hard work. Hobart was a man of conscience who brought a business-oriented pragmatism, pragmatism to the vice presidency. His personal integrity was a healthy influence felt in American politics long after his death. And last little excerpt from these articles and such I'm reading. Although not an outstanding national leader or orator in the first rank of his generation, Hobart was a competent and cautious government official he shared with Vice President Charles W. Fairbanks many of the same personal and political qualities. Hobart's short term as Vice President was soon overshadowed by the presidential election of 1900, the assassination of McKinley, and the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt. Yet during his nearly three years in office, Hobart laid the foundation for 20th century Vice Presidents from Theodore Roosevelt to Al Gore, a model presiding officer of a deliberative assembly and advisor to the president, Hobart made the vice presidential office what the framers of the Constitution properly intended it to be and lifted the office to the dignity and importance 
it deserved in the Gilded Age, as I just read from the other article, really. Massachusetts Republican Senator Henry Cabot Lodge argued that Hobart restored the vice presidency to its proper position. By honoring the office, Hobart honored himself. He also mirrored McKinley's attitudes and proved loyal to his chief. His personal integrity exerted a healthy influence in the late 19th century American politics. Hobart's death in 1899 paved the way for Theodore Roosevelt. So just a few more points, guys. Some things, uh, you know, that I'm still finding in some of these excerpts and stuff from these articles. Uh, the Michael J. Conley article that I spoke of in part one and such. Uh, the Hobarts led McKinley's Capital Society. After briefly occupying the Arlington, Arlington Hotel, they leased the Lafayette Square mansion uh, of former Pennsylvania Senator James Cameron. Um, of course, known as the Little Cream White House. We know that. Um, I'm just trying to see here. Hosted Senate dinners and parties for foreign dignitaries. Belgium's Prince Albert visited in March of 1898. And the vice president played Washington tour guide for the royal visitor and banqueted with the prince at Hobart's house. Uh, by 1898, the New York Times suggested that Mr. Hobart is already a tower of strength to the administration. The Hobarts are themselves in great demand at all the most exclusive entertainments in Washington and are quite unspoiled by the unusual attentions they are receiving. Uh, the Hobarts attended parties every night except Sundays. A regular social schedule for at least a week in advance is always on the vice president's desk, and some speculated they spent tens of thousands of dollars in entertaining by 1899. Mark Hanna, he frequented the Hobart home, after, often enjoying breakfast with the vice president. Then he would lie on the couch in Mr. Hobart's study, discussing politics until it was time to go to the Senate, Jenny Hobart remembered. President McKinley's visited regularly since the White House was a quick walk, playing cards, and spending long evenings over boxes of fragrant perfectos in consultation with the vice president on perplexing problems of state. The men grew close and testifying to Hobart's business acumen and McKinley's lack thereof, McKinley presented a salary to the vice president and Republican banker Myron Herrick for them to invest. A normal day for Garrett Hobart began with a 9 a.m. breakfast, followed by office work, where Secretary McHenry sifted through correspondence and made two piles on the vice president's desk. Personal letters and business affairs. Mr. Hobart got out of most of his directories when made vice president, so as to be free to give virtually undivided attention to his official work, but there are still many matters upon which his business associates consult him by mayor, the Washington, by mail, I'm sorry, not by mayor, by, by mail, the Washington Star reported. By 11.30 a.m., he was at the Capitol consulting with senators. Um... So let me just see here. The vice presidency, however, was not all social graces, Hobart's first year in office established him as a major congressional and administration figure. Kind of went over all those kind of things, of course. Uh, and then, you know, this article here talks about all the things that went on, on during uh, 1897, 1898, and early 1899 with the vice presidency. By mid-autumn of 1898, Garrett Hobart's health had deteriorated. Doctors diagnosed a serious heart ailment exasperated by his heavy Senate schedule, busy Washington social calendar, and a bad case of the flu. He experienced weakness, breathing difficulties, and periodic fainting spells, but his health problems were kept secret even from his family. He continued Senate duty, but after delivering the session's closing address, he was so ill he nearly collapsed. He regained enough strength to accompany McKinley on a March visit to Mark Hanna's Thomasville, Georgia home, but contracted the flu again, tired quickly, and returned to Washington 
for two months of bed rest. In April of 1899, newspapers gossiped about his condition as doctors constantly attended him. Friends blamed the humid capital climate and politicians wondered if he could stand a rigorous 1900 re-election campaign. Hobart denied any election decisions had been made and President McKinley himself, unwell, made sure to visit his ailing assistant president. Marcus Hanna reassured the press nothing but death or an earthquake can stop the renomination of Vice President Hobart. No doubt irritating his heart condition was news in May that brother-in-law Hobart A. Tuttle, New Jersey Governor Fester M. Voorhees, was news in... I'm sorry, wait. No doubt irritating his heart condition was news in May that brother-in-law Hobart A. Tuttle, New Jersey Governor Yep, Fester M. Voorhees, private secretary, was implicated in a scheme to defraud a main railroad car company. A New Jersey circuit court against decided against Tuttle in early August, and Hobart finally left Washington in early June to convalesce at Normanhurst, a Long Branch summer cottage leased from the widow of millionaire publisher Norman Monroe a short distance from his birthplace. Long Branch, New Jersey, where Hobart spent much of life, was a desirable resort in the late 19th century, populated by the wealthiest and most prominent Americans. A lovely seaside village of small houses, true cottages, with wonder, wonderful filigreed porches from which one could look out high from high bluffs over the Atlantic, described President Grant's biographer William McFeely. Grant relaxed at Long Branch the last two decades of his life, and President Gar Garfield died there in 1881. Hobart rested on doctor's orders, keeping activity to a minimum. He attended a New York dinner for the Prussian Insurance Commission, helped organize a country club and a vice president's cu cup golf tournament, as well as a horse show, and entertained friends like Mark Hanna, but most often kept still. All work was forbidden, and for the first time since he assumed the responsibilities of life, he was truly idle. Hours and days were spent on the piazzas and under the trees in absolute rest. Feeding his fish, it said a gold name, gold one named McKinley and a silver one named Bryant, and taking carriage rides. Often lacking strength, he was pushed around in a wheelchair and sight seekers peeked into the grounds to glimpse the resident celebrity. By early July, he rallied and took carriage rides around town with his wife and spoke with old friends right there in Long Branch, New Jersey. Uh, administration troubles dragged Hobart back into the limelight in July of 1899 when President McKinley asked him to request War Secretary Russell Alger, Alger's resignation. Now, we know all about this. We know what happened there. So I'm not going to really, uh, you know, read over all of that. Then also, there was another thing that happened. Um, on August 18th of, well, actually, hold on. Let me, let me, let me go back. I, I apologize. Let me actually go back a little bit here. Um, so administration troubles, we know that, blah, 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 with, with Alger. Um, Hobart's hometown Patterson Evening News doubted Alger's obliviousness to his firing and suggested that in exchange for his resignation, the vice president offered some kind of financial, financial consideration or buyout. That this consideration was the cause of the withdrawal, no one doubts. The only question that survives the bargain is the terms. They will no doubt be disclosed as events progress. Hobart was confined to bed just days after the Alger controversy. Attending a horse show in late July, he looked weak and left after only a few hours. When President McKinley departed for his annual Plattsburgh vacation, the Hobarts joined them. Exhausted by the hoopla, his fainting spells returned and he was bedridden for days. Finally, on August 25th of 1899, the presidential party returned to Long Branch, where Hobart resumed his recuperation, and onlookers noted his pale complexion and feebleness when they arrived. McKinley and Hobart received a rousing welcome, and it nearly wore out the vice president. 
He returned to Patterson for good in September. Now, the reason I bring this up is for the photo, the infamous photo. And, of course, I'm speaking of the famous photo that you're seeing on your screen right now. That's the photo that was taken at Normanhurst on the grounds of the Normanhurst estate in Long Branch, New Jersey. This is the only real, true, known photograph or photographs of William McKinley and Garrett Hobart together. This was taken on August 25th of 1899. So pretty interesting stuff. And what's even more interesting is that photo literally after Hobart died and then the 1900 election was happening, that photo was literally photoshopped back in 1900 to replace Hobart with Theodore Roosevelt in the same photo. And here, now you're seeing it here on the screen. That's the Theodore Roosevelt photo. And it's unbelievable because now you're going to see both of the photos side by side on the screen. They literally photoshopped. It's literally like they erased Garrett Hobart from history. They literally, he died and they cut him out and erased him from history. Absolutely unbelievable. Truly incredible, to be honest. So now, a little bit more here. But ominous events occurred in August and September of 1899, particularly for a weak-hearted convalescent like Hobart. At Plattsburgh, word arrived that his only surviving brother, C.T. Hobart, chief engineer on the Columbus, Lima, and Milwaukee Railroad, had been hit and severely injured by a train. He eventually recovered. But then on August 18th of 1899, came the sensational revelation that Garrett Hobart was connected with a plot to capture New York City's water franchise. Possibly illegal, definitely surreptitious, and unethical, the Ramapo scheme dominated New York news for months and impacted state and city politics for years. It may have also affected Hobart's health. Three days after the allegations, the New York Times reported that Hobart was ill in bed. Margaret Leach reported he was exhausted by the excitement, but he was likely worried by links to a brewing scandal. In mid-August of 1899, the New York City Board of Improvements debated a $200 million water contract with the Ramapo Water Company of New Jersey and New York. Prepared in secret, the contract was foisted on the board at the last minute and stipulated the company delivered 200 million gallons of water a day at $70 per million gallons for 40 years, meaning the city would be obligated to pay $5 million a year to a private water concern into the 1940s. So basically, this was like this big scandal. And the the thing was, um, the, the New York world and the New York Times uncovered intrigues among leaders in both political parties. Chief among them was Vice President Garrett A. Hobart, that he was possibly involved in this scheme. The Ramapo scheme, uh, a Stefanesque collaboration between business and political machine, one historian described it, dated from the 1880s when New Jersey State Senator Hobart attempted to pass bills allowing water franchises enormous power to acquire watersheds, a move rumored to facilitate a water supply for a rapidly growing New York City. And you can read more about the Ramapo scheme. I'm not going to get too in detail with that, but pretty crazy. That was another thing that came up only months before Hobart died. There was a committee that I believe uh, basically kind of really investigated this whole Ramapo scheme and it was called the Mazette or Mazette Committee concluded the Ramapo investigation on September 21st of 1899 Hobart his heart conditioning worsening left Long Branch for Patterson the day before it had been a stressful year for the vice president beginning with the joint traffic association decision in the fall of 1898 when his illness began This had been followed by the serious springtime attack, his brother-in-law's indiscretions, 
the Alger resignation, his brother's railroad accident, and the Ramapo accusations. All took their toll. He could no longer lie down and slept in a chair. Rumors of declining health filtered into newspapers, as did speculation on his Republican successor if Hobart did not run. Reporters congregated outside his Patterson, New Jersey home, as they had at Grant's Mount McGregor Cottage in 1885, looking for signs of alarm and tracking visitors to decipher the vice president's condition. On November 1st, Hobart's retirement from public business was announced. He would never return to Washington. Hobart's heart problems rapidly worsened, and he died the morning of November 21st of 1899, the fourth vice president to die in office. That's actually incorrect. It's the sixth. McKinley, the cabinet senators, no, I'm sorry, McKinley, the cabinet senators and congressmen attended the immense Patterson funeral rites. Vice President Hobart left an estate worth over $2.6 million, nearly $75 to $80 million in today's money. In 1903, a statue designed by Augustus St. Gaudens student Philip Martini, showing him as a vice president holding the Senate gravel, was dedicated outside Patterson City Hall, memorializing one of their most celebrated citizens. Historians have not studied Hobart closely, due primarily to the relative obscurity of the vice presidency. Hobart's Presbyterian pastor, Dr. David Magee, wrote his only biography in 1910, and Jenny Hobart completed a short remembrance of her husband's capital days in 1930. Vice presidential historian Lewis C. Hatch complimented Hobart on his central role in the McKinley administration, while Irving G. Williams sank the New Jersey politician into postbellum vice presidential oblivion, largely and justly forgotten, inferior men in an age that offered a plentitude of inferior men in high positions. In 2007, one left-wing Polish magazine resurrected Hobart's name and connected him with Vice President Dick Cheney, drawing close parallels between the two assistant presidents. Vice President Hobart lends himself well to counterfactual history. What would have happened had Hobart succeeded to the presidency after McKinley's 1901 assassination? A Hobart administration would have tightly allied with old guard, re old guard Republicanism. Senate lions like Mark Hanna, Nelson Aldrich, William Fry, and Eugene Hale were familiar and friendly as opposed to Theodore Roosevelt's hyperactive progressivism. High tariffs would protect U.S. factories and the gold standard defended from populist upstarts like Bryan. He would have been the railroad industry's advocate opposing any further regulation and resisted antitrust attacks. He would have weakened the ICC and appointed Supreme Court justices who would have backed the Joint Traffic Association. While he loyally supported 1890s American colonial expansion, Hobart lacked McKinley's... Oh, I can't even read that word. Mis Christianizing. I, I, it's actually kind of bolded out because it's a printed article. I apologize. Christianizing, civilizing impulse and would have steered a frugal, insular, restrained foreign policy. President Hobart would not have intervened in the Russo-Japanese War, sent the Great White Fleet around the world, or grabbed land for the Panama Canal. Hobart was no sable rattler in search of splendid little wars. Governing like another Chester Arthur or Benjamin Harrison, the pro-business Hobart would have infuriated early 20th century insurgents like Robert La Follette. Progressivism 
would have been temporarily derailed and Patterson would boast a presidential library celebrating Gus Hobart's achievements. An industry massed and railroads spread across gilded-aged America, politics increasingly intertwined with business. Each had what the other wanted. Business desired per permission and largest to expand into larger conglomerates. Politicians lusted after money to finance elections and bankroll entrenched power. Neither party was Im immune, but the public increasingly identified Republicans with the un union of big business, big money, and big government, a union that ignited a progressive reaction after 1900. Vice President Garrett A. Hobart directed that union as lawyer, business receiver and director, and New Jersey Republican. He represented everything progressives hated. A railroad advocate when railroads became America's most mistrusted industry. A corporate attorney who facilitated a, of capital when the public revolted against monopolies and trust. A financial operator who used his political insight to capture lucrative business opportunities and a national leader who moved easily between the worlds of political pull and economic power. As much as Hannah or any Gilded Age business politician, Hobart symbolized the era. So that's pretty much it. Just one more last thing about his legacy. Um, Hobart significantly expanded the powers of the vice presidency, becoming a presidential advisor and taking a leadership role as president of the Senate. Between his advisory and leadership roles, he was perhaps the most influential vice president since Martin Van Buren. Although Meiji, Meiji writing in 1910, stated that Hobart's death fixed his memory at the height of his fame, the former vice president is today little remembered. According to Hatfield, he is best known for his death, clearing the way for the ascent of New York Governor Theodore Roosevelt, who took Hobart's place on the Republican ticket in 1900 and succeeded as president after McKinley's assassination in 1901. A statue of Hobart erected in 1903 stands outside Patterson City Hall. The communities of Hobart, Oklahoma and Hobart, Washington are named after the former vice president. And as I just read, Michael J. Connolly finds Hobart to be very much a man of his times. As I said in that last sentence there, as much as Hannah or any Gilded Age business politician, Hobart symbolized the era. Now, I do want to leave you, before we get into a lot of bonus footage, I want to leave you with one very cool thing. This is actually recorded. It is audio of Garrett Hobart speaking. This is a speech given by Garrett Hobart. It was recorded on May 1st of 1898 at the opening of the Electrical Exposition of New York City. So here you go. Take a listen to our 24th Vice President of the United States, Garrett A. Hobart. Mr. Chairman, gentlemen of the committee, and fellow citizens, it is a great pleasure, even at the long distance separating the national capital from the nation's metropolis, to take part in the opening ceremony of the Electrical Exposition, whose managers have paid me the high compliment of requesting me to say a few words of welcome. To say that I am delighted to see you tonight is just as expressive as the greeting of my old-time friend, the blind preacher, who never in his life met me, but to express his delight at seeing me, when in fact he had never seen a living face in 20 years. Like him, I seem to see you, and to feel the influence of your presence 
Although you were so far distant, for I know you was in the sound of my voice, or at least I am so assured. Your managers have asked me to speak to you over a distance of 250 miles and across five states. But what I shall say is insignificant compared with the impressive fact that the electrical genius of our age has made possible this marvelous system of communication which annihilates time and space and distance. You who are working in the field of electricity are performing a service of great utility, giving the people an opportunity to behold what wonders God hath wrought with this mysterious agency. No wonder that in every material development, with universal support by our people, the inventions of this age and this country lead the world. No wonder that you succeed when you find all the people profitably and happily using your newest inventions as daily instruments to do their work, to furnish their light, their intelligence, their power, increasing their comfort and convenience, and adding to the happiness of life. Your remarkable discoveries and the immediate application of them to the uses of daily life follow each other with such rapidity that the human mind is almost stunned with amazement at your triumphs and achievements. Yet so quickly do these appliances enter into our everyday affairs, at the office, the home, the factory, and the shop, that we unconsciously utilize them as if they, they had always been our possession, and as if the telephone, telegraph, electric light, electric car, and the countless other manifestations of electrical energy had always existed for the comfort and convenience of man. This may, indeed, well be called the electric age, when electricity plays so important and powerful a part in almost every phase of social, commercial, and industrial life. You and your fellow workers in other lands have put the girdle of electricity about the earth, and the spark which frankly drew from the sky is the magic spark which contracts the world into such narrow limits that time and distance, land and sea, are eliminated and all parts of the globe are put into immediate and continuous contact. To have done this is to have accomplished the feat as brilliant as any recorded in the pages of civilization, progress, and yet it is only one small item in the vast total of achievements credited to this vital force, and it is only an earnest of greater achievements And of course, last but not least, guys, I just want to just tell you, there's a lot of really cool, obscure articles. There's an article from the, uh, I believe it was the San Francisco Call. Uh, I believe that was the, the newspaper, possibly. Uh, the San Francisco Call. It's uh, dated of J June 25th of 1896. And uh, it's literally... It's called Garrett Hobart. Uh, I'll tell you the exact title of the article. Garrett Hobart at his home. And it's all about his home in Patterson, New Jersey, Carroll Hall. Uh, it's a really cool article. Um, you can kind of Google it. Just type in San Francisco call 1896 Garrett Hobart at home. You can read that. It's a pretty long article, so I'm obviously not going to read it verbatim or anything like that. Um, very cool. I told you, you know, I was obviously getting a lot of my information from the Michael J. Connolly article written about uh, Garrett Hobart. Of course, the Hatfield book uh, that Hatfield wrote uh, about the vice presidents. I take a lot of excerpts from uh, the article, the, uh, uh, I believe, what was the uh, man's name? Leonard uh, Sculp or Scullop, um, a Republican nationalist in the McKinley era. Garrett A. Hobart of New Jersey and his political career and letters. It actually verbatim quotes a lot of uh, Hobart's letters in that article. Uh, and then, of course, I also told you guys about the uh, the Purcell uh, book on vice presidents, which is excellent. Um, just really good stuff. You know, really, really good stuff. Um, definitely go check them all out because there is a lot of cool information about Hobart out there. Um you know, I already told you kind of what he was, you know, who he was. He was an influential vice president. Um, 
you know, he really was. You know, there, there was a conversation that I had with Thomas Belserski that we said, you know, was Hobart the last of the, you know, obscure, insignificant vice presidents? Or was he actually the first of the significant, influential vice presidents regarding the administration that he was a part of? And, you know, I think you could kind of make a case for both. I think that when we look back on it now, Hobart was probably the first of the influential vice presidents. However, he's really just fallen into obscurity since his death. And of course, the assassination of President McKinley only a little over a year after his death, the election of 1900 before that with Teddy Roosevelt joining the ticket, all these things kind of, you know, surpassed his legacy and his memory. Uh, but it's a shame uh, because he, he was he was a vice president who did more than many, many of his uh, predecessors. There's no doubt. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Hobart's name, it's not widely recognized today. You know, however, he was quite influential during his time as vice president. And he showed what power could be exerted from that position if the president chooses to rely on their advice. That's really what it comes down to. And McKinley did. He chose to listen to Hobart. Uh, so it's it's very, very interesting. You know, this has been a lot of fun for me, guys. This is a cool one. I am going to only keep it to two parts. I know this part two is going to be a little long uh, because we've got a lot of bonus footage to show you, too. But last but not least, here you go. Garrett Hobart's mausoleum, where he's entombed at the Cedar Lawn Cemetery in Patterson, New Jersey. This is a couple pictures right now of my visit to his tomb. I, of course, visited there in 2020, and I just recently visited there uh, again. So there you go. I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, stay tuned. All I can say is, just like part one, there's plenty of bonus footage coming up here in part two. So stay tuned for it. Um, it just it, it, a lot of things that I, you know, I want to go over. So I want you guys to see in this bonus footage. Thank you so much for everything, guys. Thank you for the support. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for the comments and questions. Please keep it all up and stay tuned for the bonus footage. Cause we got a lot for you. I hope you enjoy it. I really enjoyed this. A look at our 24th vice president of the United States. Garrett A. Hobart. Stay tuned. Great stuff coming. And of course, stay tuned for next week. Our next vice presidential series installment will be back next week. Thanks, guys. See you then. Hey, guys. TJ here with Dead History. And I'm actually here with Thomas Balserski. And we are actually on the campus uh, in West Long Branch, the Norwood section, correct, uh, of Monmouth University. Uh, the reason we're here, I'm actually going to turn you guys around so I can kind of give you a view of what we're looking at here. So we're here in this quad, but if you turn around here to this beautiful, magnificent building, this is actually the Great Hall here at Monmouth University. And from what we can guess, 1929, 1930 built That's right. sometime around there, right, Thomas? Uh, so this is right around the approximate location uh, of where Garrett Hobart had a, well, he didn't have a summer residence, he didn't own it, but he was renting a summer residence uh, here. And then, of course, the famous uh, photo, uh, or, or not so famous, really kind of forgotten photo, right, Thomas, wouldn't you say, uh, of McKinley, President McKinley and Garrett Hobart uh, that you're seeing here on your screen. That was taken somewhere on these grounds. Where exactly is kind of a mystery. Uh, I mean, who knows? Thomas and I could be literally standing on the location right as I speak, but uh, we'll never really know. Uh, but this is the approximate location of where that photo was taken. 
and where there was a summer home that Hobart was renting uh, here. And he stayed here at least until September at some point of that year uh, when he was feeling even more ill. And then he returned to Patterson, New Jersey, which uh, is where he would die, of course. Thomas, anything you want to add into uh, to this? Just to say this is sometimes called Shadow Lawn Campus because the building that preceded this was called Shadow Lawn. Mm -hmm. This is the third building on the site. The first was the one that Hobart rented and spent his summers at and then McKinley visited on that day, August 25th, 1890. Now, Thomas, do, do, do we have an approximate idea of when the original structure was, was torn down, burnt, whatever happened to it? Sometime around 1904-05, it was, it was actually de demolished to make way for Shadow Lawn. So Shadow Lawn was built by uh, publisher McCall for his family who uses a summer resort, and it lasted until the mid-1920s when it burned down to replace by the current structure. Yeah. Very incredible. So yes, the third structure to really stand on this location is the structure uh, before you, the Great Hall. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. We, we'll never know where exactly that photo was taken, but we're definitely at least in the approximate location. So uh, pretty uh, pretty cool uh, piece of Hobart history. Here is uh, some bonus footage, and uh, very interestingly enough for myself, I, I grew up only about five minutes away in Eatontown, New Jersey. So uh, you know that's where I spent the the large majority of the first part of my life. First. Uh, 18 to 20 years of my life, only 5-10 minutes from here, so uh, very interesting that this is right in my backyard. So here you go guys, again, Great Hall here at Monmouth University in West Long Branch, New Jersey. Thanks guys. Hey guys, TJ here again. Uh, so we're at the back of what is the Great Hall here at Monmouth University, and uh, Thomas and I are you know, trying to get a feel of where possibly the photograph may have been taken of course again we won't really know for sure just kind of educated guess uh and thomas was just speaking to me about the photograph itself uh thomas so if you can touch on that you were saying it was probably a local photographer who took the photo right so in 1899 we did so as part of a pretty well-known and publicized trip that being said this was the era before the presidential press corps so there were no traveling photographers attached to the kidney there. So it fell upon local photographers at the site to make these photographs that they had published in these around the country. The Pack Brothers were one studio that had developed here initially in Long Branch during the 1870s, in large part because Ulysses S. Grant had made his summer headquarters and capital here. And the studio still had a presence in Long Branch. So it's almost certainly that one uh, photographer from the Pac Brothers Studios came here as part of the presidential kind of visit and stayed that photo. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Now, as far as we know, the photo, and again, you guys are going to be seeing it here on the screen pop up, this photo is the only one that we know that has survived of that visit, correct, Thomas? That's really the only photograph of the two of them ever taken together. Yeah. It's historically significant for that reason, and it's the only photo also uh, up from the visit. Okay, and now what about, uh, you, you had spoke about, there's a superimposed photo of uh, Teddy Roosevelt's face on Hobart's body of that photo. So, so explain that a little bit to, yeah, to the audience as here. As you'll see here again, it doesn't take much to manipulate a photo both in 19th century technology and today. Cut out the face, put a new face on. Theodore Roosevelt's face was put on Hobart's body, um, essentially, and it looks like if you if you kind of don't look at it carefully, uh, you can't tell that the photograph had to sort of be cut literally with yeah. scissors to make the superimposition. But it was done in 1900 as a way to publicize McKinley and Roosevelt. And because it was the only photograph that existed of McKinley and Hobart, it therefore became convenient for use in 1900 for McKinley and Roosevelt. Very, very, very cool and interesting. So there you go, guys. Thomas, thank you. And uh, so, yeah, this is the back of the Great Hall building. So it could, it could again, be right where we're standing here, uh, where that photo was taken. Uh, who knows? But, again, we are definitely in the, uh, a pr the vicinity of where that photo was taken. Thanks, guys.
Hey guys, how's it going? So, uh, I figured it would be a lot easier to just make an audio to kind of explain things to you guys of uh, what happened here. So, uh, as you guys saw, Thomas Balsersky and I, uh, you know, we, um, we obviously went to Monmouth University and we, uh, we went to the Great Hall because that is the research we initially did we thought that's where the McKinley Hobart picture was taken. However, uh, that was incorrect. So uh, here's just an excerpt uh, from something we found, a published article. The two historic mansions are located at the intersection of Cedar and Norwood Avenues in West Long Branch. Looking back to the year of 1900, one would have seen two different structures at the intersection. On the present site of Woodrow Wilson Hall, which by the way is the Great Hall, was the Hullock Farm. The Hullock Homestead was one of the old landmarks of West Long Branch. On the site of the Guggenheim Library stood Normanhurst, the home of Norman L. Munno, uh, the millionaire publisher of the Fireside Library of paperbacked dime novels. Munro laid out a tract known as Norwood Park that consisted of 25 three story cottages situated on large plots. He also built a small casino where singers and actors performed for his guests. Vice President Garrett A. Hobart rented Normanhurst for the summer of 1899. Hobart was no stranger to the area. He was born in West Long Branch and had previously summered at Monmouth Beach and Long Branch. Hobart was in ill health at the time and it was hoped that the sea air basically would be orating of the New Jersey seashore would help the basic his basic uh, health and his overall health improve. During his stay, he was visited by President William McKinley. Hobart departed from Normanhurst on September 20th of 1899, and because of his failing health, he did not return to Washington, but went to his home Carroll Hall in Patterson, New Jersey. He died at Carroll Hall on November 21st of 1899 at the age of 55. Hobart Manor, a senior citizen's housing development in Long Branch, is named for the only native New Jerseyan, with the exception of Aaron Burr, to be elected to the vice presidency. Norman Hurst met the fate of many shore mansions it was destroyed by a fire in 1902. So there you go, guys. So basically, we were just on the wrong side of the road. So basically, right across the street, uh, I believe it's Norwood Avenue, uh, right across Norwood Avenue from the Great Hall, you're still on the Monmouth University campus, is the Guggenheim Library. And the Guggenheim Library is where Normanhurst, the estate mansion that I just spoke of, that's where it once stood. So the McKinley Hobart picture was taken somewhere on the grounds or near the grounds of the current present day Guggenheim Library at Monmouth University. So that is why we're doing this correction and this uh, addendum here. Uh, uh, so take a look. And here's some footage and pictures of me visiting the Guggenheim Library grounds. Here you go, take a look. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History. And that right there is the Guggenheim Library. Let me turn you guys around. So I apologize, it's only about 6.45 in the morning. So here you go. So here's the grounds of the Guggenheim Library here at Monmouth University. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful building. Okay. Now, so this is where the picture was taken. The McKinley Hobart picture. Who knows where exactly. Could even be, 
you know, somewhere where the building actually stands, somewhere inside where the actual spot was. So the road that you're seeing all these cars on here, that's Cedar Avenue. And then if you see the traffic light right here, there's a cross street that comes this way. That's Norwood Avenue. So remember, it said on the intersection of Cedar and Norwood, so which, which would be right here, you know, right on this spot here. Right across the street is the Great Hall. I'm literally pointing like directly toward the Great Hall with my finger right now. So, as you see, Thomas Balserski and I were very close. We just were on the wrong side of the street. <laughs> so uh, here's the Guggenheim Library. Here's the grounds. And I mean, I literally could be, it could be right here. Uh, you know, it could have been right here somewhere where the picture was taken. Uh, but this is definitely 100% the spot and the location. Again, I apologize for the, the light. I know it's a little low. Uh, it's uh, only about 6.45 in the morning here in New Jersey. I am in West Long Branch, New Jersey, of course. Um, so here you go. I'm walking on the lawn here. And then it just kind of goes behind. You know, uh, this is a library and a museum today, the Guggenheim. Uh, so it's, you know, obviously you see back there. I mean, it could have been anywhere. It really could have been anywhere along here. Uh, you know, it's very hard to say. Nobody knows for sure the precise exact location. Um, but it was somewhere right back here. Uh, there definitely was uh, some ivy and some shrubbery in the picture. As, boom, here you're seeing it again on your screen. Uh, so who knows? You know, who knows where exactly it was? Uh, and then you're getting back toward the back end of things, but I'll go back toward the front. So, uh, so yeah, so here you go. Guggenheim Library uh, grounds here at Monmouth University. This is 100% where the picture was taken. Uh, I apologize <laughs> for the uh, little error, but uh, it's fun. I wanted to add both videos in even of the Great Hall, hall so you guys could kind of see the area. And you can kind of just get an idea that sometimes there's different accounts and, you know, everybody uh, kind of can make some errors, but this is definitely the right place. So there you go. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Guggenheim Library. Who knows? Maybe the picture was taken right over here. Who, you know, who's to say? So there you go, guys. The spot, location, and general vicinity of the famous McKinley Hobart photo. Thanks guys. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History. Let me flip you around, show you. So we are here in Patterson, New Jersey at the beautiful City Hall building. And here is the statue of our 24th Vice President, Garrett Hobart. Pretty cool, right here in Patterson, New Jersey. Not far from where he's buried. Pretty cool stuff. And I notice he has a gavel in his hand, Thomas. Maybe that's the uh, the gavel? Yeah, we learned an interesting fact, TJ, in that the gavel that he used during his inauguration as vice president was actually made from wood that was taken from the home site in which he was born. Yes. Yes, an orchard or something very, right on the site or very Precisely. close by. Yes. An apple tree. An apple tree, so yes. Apple wood. Yes, so there you go. So very cool. So that's probably the gavel uh, that is obviously what we uh, learned about earlier today. Very cool stuff. So here you go, Garrett Hobart statue in Patterson, New Jersey at City Hall. Thanks guys.
Hey guys, TJ here with Dead History. Uh, let me flip you guys around. Here in Patterson. So I'm on the corner of Ellison and Carroll Street. Uh, and actually, if you So Ellison and Carroll. So here's Ellison and Carroll. And right around... Uh, right around this area, somewhere, maybe this corner, maybe that corner, one of these corners was where Garrett Hobart's house was here in Patterson. Uh, not really sure exactly where, uh, but my guess is maybe this corner, you know, with this big building. But we're going to kind of look around me and Thomas, but it definitely was on the corner of Carroll and Ellison. So there you go, guys. Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, TJ here. Uh, I wanted to actually show you guys this. Here, I'm going to share my screen. So, um, so what I want to show you guys is... So, uh, as I showed you in those videos just now, Carol Hall, which was the name of the residence of Garrett Hobart in Patterson, New Jersey. So now this here... As you see, home of Mrs. Garrett A. Hobart, wife wife of late president, uh, vice president, at Carroll and Ellison Street in Patterson, New Jersey. So that says Carroll and Ellison Street, where I was, as you guys saw. Me and Thomas Balserski were right on the corner of Carroll and Ellison. Now this which says the third home, which one, two, three, number three, Carol Hall, the home of Vice President Gary D. Hobart and his wife, da, 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 the grand home, which included a picture gallery, for da, 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 and was located at the present-day intersection of Carol and Van Hooten Streets. So, if I go to Google Earth, and I say, I say Google Earth. <laughs> uh, pretty funny. Carol Street, Patterson, and Jay. So, just to kind of give you guys a perspective, I just wanted to show this. So, this is the corner of Carol and Van Hooten Streets. So, this is Van Hooten, and this is Carol right here, okay? So Carol Street, you know. So, again... This brings you, when you do Van Hooten, it's the same thing as I showed you guys, but a block down. So you see here, on the corner of Carroll and Van Hooten, there's like an empty lot here, residential lot here, and it has that, look, see, the, it's not the same, obviously, uh, thing, but it has like a fence around it. So could this be the actual old property? Um, could also be this, or is it, you know, where this looks like a school or something to that effect is here on the corner of Van Hooten and Carroll. So I'm not sure. It could be this, it could be this, or it even could be this. Because if you look where Thomas and I were, I go down the block, boom, boom, there, there's where we were. This is the corner of Carroll in Ellison Street. Remember, that's the uh, the the housing uh, project there, the residential, the other residential, and then this like I don't know industrial building on the corner here. But I parked right here, and Thomas and I were right over here, and we recorded over here. You guys just saw that video, so I don't know. It's two conflicting reports. According to this one, we were in the right place, right here somewhere. But according to this one, it's on the corner of Van Hooten and Carroll, which, as I just showed you guys, is actually technically this next block. We were only a block down, but is it here? You know, so who knows? Um, you know, obviously I'd have to dive into the, like Patterson, New Jersey records somehow, but we were in the general vicinity 
but I wanted to show you guys this because it may have been a block off, but I'm not exactly sure. So there you go, guys. General vicinity of Carroll Hall, uh, the home of, of course, um, our 24th Vice President of the United States, Garrett Hobart. Carroll Hall there in Patterson, New Jersey. Thanks, guys. Someone dies in office. Hey guys, TJ here with Dead History, and I'm here in Patterson. Let me flip you guys around. Uh, and this is actually the uh, Presbyterian Church where uh, Garrett Hobart's funeral was held, right here in Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, beautiful, beautiful old church. It is the same exact building and structure that stood and where his funeral was held. So, uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, Beautiful, beautiful old church. What do you think the odds that the uh, front door is open? Probably not, right? Hey, if it were a Sunday. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. There you go, guys. The church where Hobart's funeral took place here in Patterson, New Jersey. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History. And this building behind me, let me show you where I'm at. So I am actually at Cedar Lawn Cemetery here in Patterson, New Jersey. And this building right here, this is actually the receiving vault that Garrett Hobart's body was originally placed in after his funeral. So before the uh, construction of his mausoleum was complete um, this is where his body was held so like I said this is at the Cedar Lawn Cemetery here in Patterson New Jersey and this building on uh, let me try to get out of the Sun for you guys there we go this building right here this is the receiving vault that our 24th vice president of the United States was in Garrett Hobart uh, for some time actually so there you go, guys. Receiving vault at the cemetery here in Patterson, New Jersey, where Garrett Hobart's body uh, was placed after his funeral. There you go. Thanks, guys.